he's going to sign autograph cards, and we have tattoos to hand out. So no matter whether you're four years old or two years old or 69 years old, come on over. We'll sign an autograph card. Because, you know, at one point, he is going to retire. So if you want that card, well, I just catch him. And uh, Rob is at the U.S. Navy Fair Pilot School. high-speed pass, 1829-cylinder engine singing along, and the FM2 in hot pursuit. Yeah, you're saying uh, one Grumman design and then 30% larger than the other. They're very similar, and the, again, the other Grumman airplanes are, are very, very uh, closely resemble one another in the family heritage. Okay, here comes the duck in for landing. Notice it's deployed its landing gear, the F3F flying over. The duck was used for a variety of duties, uh, air sea rescue, uh, observation, liaison. Very useful airplane, very robust construction on that too. Half the aircraft's fuselage is the big boat hull. The uh, aerial victory marks by David McCampbell, who was the highest scoring Navy ace in World War II. 
And the first aircraft that's going has the 1943-44 Tritone paint job. Intermediate blue size. Overall dark blue top and white bottom. And then later they went to the tall dark blue. Yeah, they ended up going with the almost black and dark blue. Earlier round, they went with the black and white bottom. And then later they went eventually turn white uh, from all the salt air. So that's 3 through 1945 accounted for a 19 to 1 kill ratio against the Japanese. Okay, here we have uh, Corsair taking off. Corsair was not originally okay for carrier operations because it would bounce too much on landing and the pilot sat too far out. Here we have another Corsair. I have a kept response. You'll notice that the Corsair has an inverted gull wing. Uh, yeah, as Charlie was saying, the F4U was the very first airplane to employ what was then an 1800 horsepower Pratt Whitney XR2800 engine. And uh, it, it swung a very big propeller over 13 and a half feet diameter. And to eliminate the long landing here, they made that gull wing design really well. Okay, we have a flyover of two Hellcats. Corsairs approaching from the east. Yeah, we got a Vic of Corsairs right now. Woo! The power of Pratt Whitney flying over you right now. That yeah, Corsair was uh, originally accepted as a fighter to hit 400 miles an hour in level flight. There goes that Bearcat. Because the Corsair was not uh, suitable for aircraft carrier use, they were relegated to uh, island use by the United States Marines and Navy and uh, made a very good reputation of themselves in the first six months. Uh, a lot of squadrons shooting down a lot of Japanese aircraft down there in the uh, Solomon Islands and other parts of the Pacific there. Okay, now we've got uh, Avengers flying over. The Avenger did not start out well. They first started out at the Battle of Midway and they did not achieve any success in that battle, but they went on to become in some ways the most successful torpedo bomber of the war. We also used them as horizontal bombers too, and pilots who flew them generally preferred them to the SB-2C Helldiver. Another look at an Avenger in a typical Pacific three-tone scheme. Cyclone R 2600 14 cylinder engine, it's a very large 14 cylinder engine powering the Avenger. And here's a look at something you don't see often this is the Lockheed Harpoon PV 2. Yeah, the PV 2 is generally used as a maritime bomber, it's used for maritime patrol. It's actually a pretty fast airplane, it would do over 300 miles per hour. This was a plane that uh, the Marines actually lucked out. They got to use these planes before the Navy did. Bearcat showing how what the Japanese never had to face. We didn't have this one ready in time. with our United States Navy, a relationship that lasted over 50 years. 
culminating in the F-14 Tomcat, which uh, finally was uh, decommissioned from service just five years ago. But the Grumman had built so many fine airplanes for our Navy, not just fighters, not just attack bombers, but surveillance and uh, anti-submarine warfare aircraft, uh, submarine hunters, things of that nature, uh, rescue aircraft. Nothing sounds like a radial engine. You don't hear this kind of sound every day. Not your usual aeronautical sounds. Okay, here comes that PB-2 Harpoon, based on the PB-1 Ventura. That's a good looking plane right there. A little bit larger than the PB-1 Ventura. You can see a lot of design similarities though between it and the P-38. Here come the Corsairs again. Corsair is probably the most famous Navy fighter for the average enthusiast, casual enthusiast, but uh, really the Hellcat actually did more work in the Pacific in a quicker period of time. Yeah, the Hellcat had a higher kill ratio. It was slower than the Corsair, but more maneuverable. All right, our Tiger Cats are getting low now. This is what I was waiting for. Look at this twin-engine hot rod as it comes by. F7F Tiger Cat at a top speed of about 450 miles an hour. An absolutely aesthetically beautiful airplane. Very sleek fuselage design. It's hard to believe that, and the Avenger came out at the same time. Now, the Avenger had a three man crew, had a pilot, and a dorsal gunner and a ventral gunner. And here we have the PB2 again, and a Corsair up on top. Corsairs actually continued to employ them after World War II. They used them in Korea. Uh, a few Latin American countries actually had them in their air forces up to the late 60s. And uh, Corsair was one of those piston engine airplanes that endured. There were others that could have, but for one reason or another, the Corsair stayed the inventory of many countries, including us. Yeah, we chose to send the Corsair to Korea. I don't believe we sent the Bearcat to Korea. No, Bearcat never fought in Korea. It went to Vietnam, though, Indochina, and the use of the French, and then later South Vietnamese. When the French capitulated there, South Vietnamese took over those aircraft. Used them for various uh, attack duty. Well, just like we sent the P-51, but not the P-47 to Korea. Yeah, I think we should have sent the P-47 into Korea. That would have been the real answer for ground attack. Once again, here comes an Avenger. Three-color scheme. The airplane's got a 54-foot wingspan. It's a big bird. Yeah, the Avenger was a very versatile airplane. It's good for bombing, torpedo bombing. And the pilots who flew it said it was, it was demanding, but it was a maneuverable plane for its size. Navy Ace in World War II. They were that uh, venture in the North Atlantic Steam again. Notice when they fly over, a lot of them have a Sky Raider, a Skyhawk, and an SPD. And what's the one thing they all have in common, Kevin? They're all Douglas airplanes, and they all have uh, designer Ed Heinemann in common. Ed Heinemann was a longtime employee at Douglas Aircraft and designed some fantastic airplanes, not just these. Uh, Marcus Island. That Bearcat's a hot rod. Yeah, late in the war, these piston engine planes got pretty powerful. Another good look at that twin engine F7F. F7F 
seven and a half and a half eight F, both the uh, Tiger Cat and the Bear Cat, just too late to see action in World War II. They were really front line anymore. Here's another good look at three Douglas airplanes from three different generations. The lead aircraft is the SPD-5 Dauntless. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, that Dauntless you see is a real combat veteran. That airplane performance their aerobatic routine. Comes the and it shows you some of the perimeters. Uh, here's a good look at the A4 coming by now. This is one of our jets from the late 50s, early 60s. This airplane was used extensively during Vietnam, as was the Sky Raider. A good look there at the Sky later on. Yeah, I remember seeing the Blue Angels perform with the Skyhawk. That was back in the mid to early, uh, early to mid 80s, and I remember it was a very impressive show. Because, you know, before that, they flew the F-4 fan. And you want to talk about a big, heavy, good gas guzzling airplane, boy. The A-4 probably gave them the nimbleness they needed. 